Hi, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, KK Yeo from uh, the National Heart Centre Singapore. Welcome to APSC uh, 2021. Today's session is um, a, a joint symposium with the Asia Pacific Cardiometabolic Consortium. And this is a session that is uh, supported by an educational grant from MGEN. The title of our uh, symposium today is Update on Cardiometabolic Disease. And with us, we have an exciting um, series of three lectures. The first is by Professor Junior Ako um, on new lipid guidelines, what is new and important. The second is by Professor Catherine Tan on obesity, can we prescribe weight loss? The third is by Professor Stephen Nichols on fish oil, do the types matter? And uh, these are um, uh, recorded lectures. And uh, with that uh, introduction, let me uh, uh, I'll hand you over to Professor Junior Ako, head of the Department of uh, Cardiovascular Medicine at the Kitasato University, Japan. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Ako. Thank you, Chairman. The title of my talk is New Lipid Guidelines What's New and Important? This is my disclosure. Today, I would like to go over two big guidelines. One is 2018 HA ACC guidelines, and the other one is 2019 ESC guidelines. 10 messages from 2018 HA ACC guidelines are shown here. In the guidelines, no LDL cholesterol goal was set. Instead, intensity of statin therapy is determined by the patient risks. As with the 2013 guidelines, 2018 guidelines recommend high-intensity statin therapy in secondary prevention. In the second text, it reads, in patients with clinical SCVD, reduce low-density lipoproteins cholesterol with high-intensity statin therapy or maximally tolerated statin therapy. In the guidelines, a new threshold is shown here. Let me read the text. In the very high risk SCVD, use an LDL cholesterol threshold of 70 mg per deciliter to consider addition of non statins to statin therapy. So, this is a new one. There are several messages to show the full statin benefit groups, which I will review in the next slide. Let me skip to the last message, a recommendation on the lipid measurement. Assess adherence and percentage response to LDLC lowering medications and lifestyle changes with repeat lipid measurement 4 to 12 weeks after starting indication or dose adjustment repeated every 3 to 12 months as needed. In the HACC guidelines, four groups of patients are considered to benefit from statin therapy. One is secondary prevention, clinical SCVD. The other ones are primary prevention. First, LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 190 and diabetes, and third, 10-year SCVD risks greater than or equal to 7.5%. This is a flowchart for the patient with primary prevention. The intensity of statin therapy is determined by the risk. Patients with LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 190 mg per deciliter High-intensity statin is recommended. Patients with diabetes and patients with 10-year risk of ACDD greater than or equal to 7.5% moderate intensity statin is recommended. For the secondary prevention, the patients are further divided into very high risk versus not at very high risk. 
Very high risk of future ACVD events include recent major ACVD events, including recent ACS, history of MI, stroke, and PAD. High risk conditions include age, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. Very high risk includes a history of multiple major ACVD events or one major ACVD event and multiple high risk conditions. For patients with not at very high risk, use of high intensity statin is recommended. If the LDL cholesterol does not reach below 70, addition of ezetimib is class 2b. For the patients with very high risk SCVD, high intensity statin is recommended. If the LDL cholesterol does not reach below 70 with statin therapy, addition of ezetimib is class 2a. If the LDL cholesterol doesn't reach below 70 with maximal LDL cholesterol lowering therapy, a PCSK9 inhibitor gets class 2A recommendation. Again, for four statin benefit groups, these are the recommended statin therapy. Intensive statin therapy is determined by the risk group. This slide shows the recommendation of triglycerides. It's recommended to identify and address reversible causes such as obesity, metabolic syndrome, and so on. Pharmacologic treatment is reserved for patients with severe hypertriglycemia with fasting triglycerides greater than or equal to 500 mg per deciliter. For LPA-A, it's recognized as a risk enhancer. In this table, epilitol A greater than or equal to 50 mg per deciliter is considered as a risk enhancer. Let me take a look at 2019 ESC guidelines. In this paper, CV risk was categorized as very high risk, high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. Documented SCVD or secondary prevention is itself considered as very high risk. A calculated risk score greater or equal to 10% for 10-year risk of fatal CVD is classified as very high risk. 10-year risk between 5 to 10% is classified as high risk, and 10-year risk between 1% to 5% is classified as moderate risk. In the 2019 ESC guidelines, LDL goal was set for each risk category. Let me read some of the text to show the rationale of this paper. The greater the absolute LDLC reduction, the greater the CV risk reduction. No level of LDLC below which benefit causes or harm occurs has been defined. The total CV risk reduction should be individualized, and this can be more specific if goals are defined. The use of goals can also aid patient-doctor communication. For all those reasons, the European Task Force retains a goal approach to lipid management. This paper adopts a goal-oriented stepwise approach. Once pharmacologic treatment is indicated, high-intensity study is recommended. Then, if the goal is not met, Ezetimibe is indicated. Then, if the goal is not met, 
addition of PCSK9 inhibitor is recommended. This graph shows the treatment goal for LDL cholesterol. For low risk patients, LDL goal is set at 116 mg per deciliter. For moderate risk patients, that is 10 year risk between 1% to 5%, the goal is 100 mg per deciliter. For high risk patients with 10 year risk between 5 to 10%, the goal is 70 mg per deciliter. And for very high risk patients, that is ASCVD, whether it's clinical or imaging based diagnosis, and patients with 10 year risk greater than or equal to 10%, the goal was set at 55 mg per deciliter. Detailed recommendation is given in this table. In secondary prevention and LDL cholesterol reduction of greater than or equal to 50% from baseline, and an LDL cholesterol goal of less than 55 mg per deciliter. In addition, for ACVD who experienced a second vascular event within two years while taking maximally tolerated statin-based therapy, an LDL cholesterol goal of less than 40 may also be considered. This is a table for triglycerides. One new recommendation after the results of reduced it trial. As for the treatment of hypertriglycemia, use of 4 grams per day EPA gets 2A recommendation for high-risk patients with TG level between 135 to 499 mg per deciliter. Fibrates remain 2B recommendation. There are only few recommendations on epididyl A in the guidelines. Epididyl A measurement is a 2A recommendation to identify high risk patients. Epididyl A over 180 mg per deciliter is considered a high risk as FH. This year, ESC also issued yeah, CBD prevention guidelines. This paper does not add very much on lipid management from the 2019 ESC guidelines on lipid disorders. But for the measurement of lipids and lipoproteins, the paper recommends no fasting sampling for general screening. So in summary, this is a table of comparison between the two big guidelines. 2018 AHA ACC guidelines recommend risk-based statin intensity with no LDL goal, while 2019 ESC guidelines recommend risk-based treatment goal strategy. AHA ACC guidelines use Lipid measurements to assess compliance to therapy, while ESC guidelines use them for goal attainment. HAACC guidelines divide secondary prevention to very high risk and not at very high risk. HAACC guidelines suggest non statin therapy when LDO does not reach below 70, while ESC guidelines recommend incremental non-statin therapy to achieve a goal of LDL cholesterol lower than 55 mg per deciliter. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, Junior, for um, the very nice and comprehensive overview of the new guidelines. And I think we can have a discussion later on as to what that means for us in practice. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Catherine Tan, the Sir David Todd Professor in Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. 
And I think this is going to be a talk that all of us uh, can relate to at some point in our lives. Um, obesity, can we prescribe weight loss? Uh, over to you, Professor Tan. Good morning. I'm Catherine Tan from the University of, of Hong Kong. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to address the question, can we prescribe weight loss? In my talk, I will cover the current approach in the management of obesity and touch on the new therapy that has recently become available. I also briefly cover some emerging therapies. Obesity is a chronic relapsing disease, which in turn acts as a gateway to a range of other non-communicable diseases. So obesity is associated with multiple comorbidities. To get a significant improvement in obesity-associated comorbidities, we need to achieve at least a 5 to 10% reduction in weight in our obese individuals. I'm sure all of you will agree with me if you're managing patients with obesity, treatment of obesity is difficult. Behavioral methods of weight control often fail. Weight loss and weight loss maintenance is difficult to achieve with lifestyle modification alone. Medications we have currently approved for the weight loss of obesity have had a checkered history, and we have seen withdrawal of several approved drugs owing to serious adverse events. Currently, we have relatively few medication options available. Pharmacotherapy has limited efficacy and can only achieve 5 to 10% weight reduction. Bariatric surgery is effective, but it is invasive, not always available or indicated. This table gives you current pharmacotherapy approved for the management of obesity. Liricotide is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Latroxone bupirone is a combination of opioid antagonist and a reuptake inhibitor of dopamine and norepinephrine. Olicet is a pancreatic and gastric lipase inhibitor. Phentamine and topiramate is a norepinephrine releasing agent and GABA receptor modulator combination. And as you can see with our current therapy, at most we can achieve roughly between three to 8% of weight loss in our obese subjects. So we really do need more effective therapy in the management of obesity. So we now have a new drug that has recently been approved in the treatment of obesity, and this is semaglutide. So Mectotide is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. GLP-1 or GLP-1 receptor agonists are currently being used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes because these impotent hormones stimulate insulin secretion and reduces glucagon secretion in the pancreas. It also reduces gluconeogenesis in the liver and thereby normalizes glycemia. GLP-1 or GLP-1 receptor agonist also has an effect on the gut. It slows down gastric emptying and gastric motility. It also has a central effect. It reduces appetite and reduces food intake. So it's also useful for weight management. Liricotide is the first GLP-1 receptor agonist approved for the treatment of obesity. It can give you roughly around 5% of weight loss and has to be given as the daily subcutaneous injection. Semaglutide is a new GLP-1 analog. It has 94% homology to the human GLP-1 molecule. It has a long half-life, therefore it can be given as a weekly subcutaneous injection. Currently, semaglutide is already approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes at a dosage of 1 milligram weekly. 
Semaglutide has been evaluated in the treatment of obesity in the STEP program. This table gives you an overview of all the STEP trials, and the STEP trials are carried out in obese individuals or overweight individuals with obesity-related comorbidities. All the STEP trials are large, randomized, placebo-controlled trials with at least 68 weeks follow-up. It includes a broad population of adults with overweight or obesity with or without type 2 diabetes. All the STEP trials include a hypocaloric diet plus recommendations for increased physical activity. And in the STEP-3 trial, it also includes an additional intensive behavioral therapy arm with an initial eight-week low-caloric diet to maximize weight loss effects. So the STEP-1 trial evaluates the efficacy of semaglutide in the treatment of obesity in adults with BMI greater than 30 kilograms per meter square or overweight with BMI greater than 27 kilograms per meter square with comorbidities. Patients with diabetes were excluded in this trial. Subjects were randomized to semaglutide 2.4 milligram or placebo given with a pre-filled pen injector. The starting dose of semaglutide was 0.25 milligram per week for the first four weeks and gradually, gradually escalated to 2.4 milligram per week by week 16. All subjects also received standard lifestyle intervention. So at the end of 68 weeks, the mean weight loss was 14.9% in the semaglutide group compared to 2.4% in the placebo group. The actual weight loss was 15.3 kilogram compared to 2.6 kilogram in the placebo group. This figure shows you the proportion of participants who achieved greater than 10% weight loss. 69% of the semaglutide group achieved greater than 10% weight loss compared to 12% in the placebo group. Up to one third of the subjects who received semaglutide actually achieved greater than 20% weight loss compared to only 1.7% in the placebo group. In terms of side effects, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation, are the commonest side effects experienced by the subjects. The discontinuation rate was 7% in the semaglutide group compared to 3% in the placebo group. A significantly greater proportion of subjects experienced gastrointestinal symptoms in the semaglutide group compared to the placebo group. Injection site reactions are comparable between the two groups. In terms of safety, hypoglycemia is very rare. Gallbladder related disorders are mainly due to gallstones. There's no signal of increased risk of acute pancreatitis in the trial. And there is also no between group differences in neoplasms. In terms of the GI side effects, they are usually transient mild to moderate in severity and resolve without permanent discontinuation of the regimen. Now, if we look at the step three trial, this is evaluating the efficacy of semaglutide with intensive behavioral therapy added on. So all subjects in this trial also received intensive behavioral therapy. This consisted of 30 counseling sessions, increased physical activity, and an eight week low calorie diet followed by a hypocaloric diet. So at the end of the study period of 68 weeks, we see a 16% weight reduction in the semaglutide group compared to 5.7% in the placebo group. 75% of subjects in the semaglutide group 
achieve greater than 10% weight loss, 56% achieve greater than 15% weight loss, and 36% actually achieve greater than 20% weight loss compared to 3.7% in the placebo group. So semaglutide is a very effective weight loss agent. We see a 15% to 18% weight loss in the step one, two, and four trials. The mean 15% weight loss is nearly twice what is seen with other FDA-approved anti-obesity medications. And nearly one-third of patients who receive semaglutide achieve weight loss greater than 20%, which approach weight loss we see by achieved by sleeve gastrectomy. The most common side effects are gastrointestinal, and they tend to be transient, mild or moderate in severity. To minimize these side effects, the dose should be gradually increased over a period of 16 to 20 weeks to the dose of 2.4 milligram once weekly. Does the mecatai have any cardiovascular benefits? This question is being addressed with, by the cardiovascular outcome trial, the SELECT trial, and this will be completed in 2023. And semaglutide has received FDA approval for the treatment of obesity in June this year. Are there new emerging therapies? And I'm just going to show you two potential promising therapies that are being evaluated. The first is a combination of a long-acting amylin analog with semaglutide. So in this phase 1b trial, obese individuals with BMI between 27 to 40 kilogram per meter square were randomized to semaglutide plus cagrinotide, which is the long-acting amylin analog versus semaglutide and placebo. None of these subjects were given lifestyle interventions in this phase 1b trial. So if we just look at the cohort 6, which is the cohort that received the highest dose of the amylin analog 4.5 milligram with semaglutide, you can see the, by adding the amylin analog, we see a much greater degree of weight loss compared to those who only receive semaglutide with placebo. Another new agent is tisapatide, which is a novel gill incretin agonist. It's a multifunctional peptide based on the native GIP peptide sequence, and it has been modified to bind to GIP or GLP-1 receptor. The SERPAS phase three program was carried out to evaluate the efficacy of tesapatide in the treatment of type two diabetes. The results from the SERPAS trials have been presented in the ADA meeting in June this year and has also been published in the New England Journal and the Lancet. So if you look this, figure shows you the body weight change from baseline. And if you look at those who received the highest dose of tisapatide, which is 50 milligram, the weight loss is somewhere between 10% to 13% in those surplus trials. So tisapatide is now currently being evaluated as a treatment of obesity in the CERMAV phase three program. So in conclusion, incretin-based therapy is highly effective at achieving and maintaining weight loss when combined with diet and exercise. The weight loss effects of incretin-based therapy are likely driven by the CNS effect on satiety and hunger rather than the direct effect on the GI tract. The glucose-lowering effects of incretin makes this approach particularly promising in those patients with type 2 diabetes or in those who are at risk of developing diabetes. The cardiovascular benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists 
may also make this treatment useful in patients with cardiovascular disease and obesity. The dose-dependent gastrointestinal adverse events can usually limit the maximum tolerated dose achieved, and by slowly up titrating the dose, we can minimize these adverse effects. The dual GRP and GLP-1 agonists shows impressive weight loss and A1C lowering effects in phase three diabetes trials, and is a potential promising therapy for obesity management. So can we prescribe weight loss? Well, I hope I have convinced all of you that the answer is yes. We now have new pharmacotherapies that are effective and safe, and there are more effective future pharmacotherapies that may become available and fill the efficacy gap between behavioral intervention and bariatric surgery. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. I, I must say that um, I'm a bit more motivated to order these drugs for my patients now. Um, we do have a lot of questions about when and how to prescribe these drugs and we'll leave this for the discussion later on. Um, now, um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Stephen Nichols, Director at the Monash Heart and Monash Health uh, Victorian Heart Institute in Australia. His topic is going to be on fish oil. Do the types matter? Over to you, Steve. Hi, my name is Steve Nichols from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. What I'd like to talk about today is the impact of fish oils and the results of large clinical trials in recent years that have shown different findings and try and understand the differences between those studies. This slide summarises my disclosures. So for more than half a century, there's been increasing interest in the potential for administration of either fish oil or omega-3 fatty acids to reduce cardiovascular risk. This began with observations from large population studies that suggested that greater consumptions of either fatty fish or fish oil associated with cardiovascular protection. In subsequent analyses of those studies, we saw that higher plasma or red blood cell levels of EPA or DHA appeared to associate with a lower cardiovascular risk. The GISI intervention study that was performed prior to widespread use of statins suggested that administration of omega-3 fatty acids may be protective. However, a large number of clinical trials performed following that using largely low doses of omega-3 fatty acids, demonstrated no cardiovascular benefit. And that's provided confusion given that we know that there is a high rate of over-the-counter consumption of omega-3 fatty acids in the community. More recently, we've seen the results of large clinical trials demonstrate differing effects on cardiovascular outcomes with different preparations of omega-3 fatty acids. The Japan EPA Lipid Intervention Study, or JELUS, enrolled more than 18,000 patients from Japan and randomized patients in an open label fashion to treatment with statin alone or statin in combination with 1.8 grams per day of EPA. Patients followed for five years, and as you can see here, administration of EPA in an open label form in combination with statin produced a 19% reduction in clinical risk compared to statin treatment alone. More recently, we saw the really exciting results of the Reduce It study. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial of four grams per day of purified EPA in the form of icosapin. And in patients with high CV risk and high triglyceride levels, you saw that administration of high-dose icosapin produce a 25% re reduction in cardiovascular risk. Not only did we see a reduction in the time to first event in that trial, but we saw, as importantly, a reduction in total cardiovascular events, reflecting that many of these patients are at a high risk, not just of having one event, but many events in the future. And we see a clinical benefit in favor of high dose icosapin across the board for patients in this study. To try and provide some form of biological rationale for the benefits we saw in the reduced study, we saw the results of the Evaporate study presented at the ESC meeting in 2020. This was a serial CT coronary angiogram study, a small study of 68 patients 
treated for 18 months with either a cosipant or a similar mineral oil placebo as used in the reduce it study. And what we saw in this study was that administration of icosapent had a favorable effect on the change in both total and low attenuated plaque volumes over the course of the study. Now the patients in these studies differed in terms of the baseline levels of plaque at the start, but you can see that there is a favorable effect in the serial change in atheroma burden in favor of high dose icosapent, providing a potential biological rationale for the benefits we see in reduce it. More recently, we've seen divergent results with administration of high dose combination EPA and DHA. The first of these findings is a study called STRENGTH. STRENGTH was a large cardiovascular outcomes trial. Again, patients high CV risk, high triglyceride, low HDL cholesterol. In this study, we administered four grams per day of omega-3 uh, fatty acid, comprising both EPA and DHA in a carboxylic acid formulation. And we compared it to a corn oil comparator. And you can see throughout the course of the study, there's absolutely no sign of clinical benefit, suggesting a very different result to what we saw in Reduce It. And about the same time, we saw the results of the OMEMI study. This is a Scandinavian study in older patients. And again, we see that while administration of composite EPA and DHA increased appropriately the fatty acid levels, both within plasma and red blood cells, that did not translate to a reduction in myocardial infarction, revascularization, stroke, death, or hospitalization for heart failure. So why do we see the disparate results in these findings? There are three potential hypotheses. And if we focus on the reduce it and strength comparison, it's an important question to ask. Firstly, the reduce it study used purified EPA that achieved moderately higher EPA levels compared with the strength study. Could the higher achieved EPA levels in reduce it explain the more favorable outcomes? Secondly, the strength study used a mixture of EPA and DHA. Could the DHA component have exactly counterbalanced the benefits of EPA, resulting in a precisely neutral outcome in strength? And then finally, the studies differed in terms of the comparator used. The mineral oil placebo that was used in Reduce It had biochemical effects. It actually increased LDL cholesterol by 10.9%, and it increased HSCRP levels by 32.3%. That raised concerns by some investigators whether the favorable results were in part or driven largely by potential toxicity of mineral oil. In contrast, the strength study used a corn oil comparator which exhibited relatively neutral effects. Are there differences in the biology between different species of EPA and DHA? Well, the preclinical studies would suggest potentially that's the case. We know that EPA preserves membrane structure and normal distribution of cholesterol. It inhibits lipid oxidation and related cholesterol crystal formation. And it influences signal transduction pathways that are related to inflammation and vasodilatation. In contrast, DHA increases membrane fluidity and promotes lipid domain changes it has reduced antioxidant activity due to lipid disordering effects and has been reported to concentrate in brain and retinal membranes. And in mouse studies, as you see on the right, we see that there is a clear inverse relationship between the ratio of EPA to DHA and expression of a range of pro-inflammatory factors within the vessel wall, suggesting that a more favorable profile of EPA compared to DHA may be more vascular protective, at least in mouse studies. Now within the strength study, when we looked at the impact of the different treatments on omega-3 fatty acid levels, both within plasma and red blood cells, we saw relatively predictable changes. In the EPINOVA group, we saw overall a 268% increase in plasma EPA levels, nearly 300% if you look at the tissue levels within red blood cells, and you see much more modest increases in plasma DHA levels, 39.7% increase in plasma, 
23.9% increase in the red blood cell. And as we would have predicted, we see no significant increase in these EPA levels in the corn oil group. What if we look at the median EPA and DHA levels after 12 months? And importantly, if you look at the upper tertile within the omega-3 carboxylic acid group within the strength study, you see that there in fact is a 443% increase in plasma EPA levels with Epinova, a 68% increase in DHA levels in the same treatment group. And so in that upper tertile, we're seeing at least similar changes in EPA levels as we saw in the reduce it study, if not greater. And you see that nearly 70% increase in plasma DHA levels. What happens if we look at the hazard ratio for cardiovascular events compared with corn oil in patients in the strength study stratified according to achieved levels of plasma EPA? Regardless of the tertile, the hazard ratio is not significant. No signal of cardiovascular benefit, even in the patients who achieve the highest levels of EPA. Similarly, what if we look at patients stratified according to achieved levels of DHA? And what's important is that we similarly see no impact on cardiovascular risk the higher your DHA levels go. Not only no signal of benefit, but importantly, no signal of harm. And that certainly would have been one of the hypotheses put forward that the DHA increase may have counteracted any potential benefit of EPA and strength. And that simply doesn't appear to be the case. If we look at this from a event curve perspective, here you look at the incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events, comparing the plasma EPA, plasma DHA, and just looking at those individuals who receive the top tertile of each of those levels compared with the overall corn oil group. And you see that there's absolutely no suggestion of benefit throughout the course of the study, even in the patients who achieve the highest levels of either EPA or DHA. If we look at it a different way and say, well, what about the patients who had the greatest increase in either plasma or EPA or DHA similarly? Compared with the corn oil group, we see no indication of altering cardiovascular risk compared to the corn oil group alone. So that's what we've learned looking at EPA versus DHA and looking at levels in cardiovascular risk and strength. What if we look at this question of the comparator? Here are the biochemical effects in the two studies, mineral oil comparator in the reduce it study on the left, corn oil comparator in the strength study on the right. You see relatively comparable effects on triglycerides, but you do see differences with mineral oil increasing LDL cholesterol and APOB levels by that kind of seven to 10% range, no increase with corn oil. And you see the mineral oil comparator in the reduced study increase HSCRP levels by 32%. We see no increase in HSCRP levels with corn oil in the strength study. Now we have seen some small studies start to emerge using mouse models, suggesting that mineral oil administration may increase intestinal permeability and start to increase levels of inflammatory markers such as lipopolysaccharide within the circulation, suggesting a potential increase of permeability of the gut to pro-inflammatory factors into the systemic circulation. Now, recently at the European Society of Cardiology, we saw a provocative population study analysis attempt to delineate the potential effect of these biochemical differences in the studies on cardiovascular risk. Investigators using data from the Copenhagen general population study took individuals in that study who were very similar to those patients that were enrolled in reduced and strength in terms of age, gender, amount of follow-up, uh, um, statin use, and uh, known history of cardiovascular disease. And they modeled the relative effects in this slide on the active treatment group of the effects of biochemistry. And you can see that when they did that, the active group in the Copenhagen general population study 
appeared to have a relatively modest reduction in cardiovascular risk compared with individuals who did not have such a change. What if we look at the impact of the mineral oil and corn oil comparators in those studies? And you see a clear difference between the two. When you modeled individuals who had corn oil type biochemical effects on the right, not surprisingly, that translates to no impact on cardiovascular risk. However, on the left, when you model that 10% increase in LDL cholesterol and that 32% increase in HSCRP levels, that does translate to a significant increase in cardiovascular risk. So what happens if we model the between arm differences in those two studies in that population study in yellow? You see on the right, the between arm biochemical differences would have translated to no impact on cardiovascular risk in the strength type population. In the reducer type population on the left, it would have translated to a hazard ratio of 0.88. Whereas we know the hazard ratio was 0.75 in the reduce it randomized clinical trial itself, suggesting that the biochemical effects that we observe and the differences between the mineral oil and the icosapent groups in the reduce it study do not explain all of the differences between those two groups, suggesting there continue to be clinical benefit, although the magnitude of the benefit is unlikely to be the 25% reduction we see in the reduce it study with icosapin. Now, what other signals do we see in these studies that are worth interest? It's important to note that in the strength study, we saw a potential clinical benefit of administration of omega-3 fatty acids in Asian patients. This requires further exploration, but does suggest that there may be potential geographic and cultural differences that should be explored further. One consistent finding in all of these studies has been an increase in rate of atrial fibrillation with administration of high dose omega-3 fatty acids. We've now seen this not only in the strength study, the reduced study, the OMEMI study, suggesting that whether there is an overall MACE benefit, we see that there is a small increase in rate of atrial fibrillation, the clinical significance of which we need to understand further. So how do we put this all together? First of all, we know that administration of low dose omega-3 fatty acids do not lower cardiovascular risk. We have high dose EPA being beneficial in two randomized control trials. We have high dose EPA DHA combinations that are not beneficial in two randomized clinical trials. And we have a questionable relationship between EPA DHA levels and cardiovascular risk. We do see an atrial fibrillation signal that is consistent, although the mechanism underlying this remains uncertain. Putting this all together, we need to rethink how best to incorporate omega-3 fatty acids, largely in a purified EPA form, into our cardiovascular prevention regimens. We have learned much, but we have much more to learn. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, that is really quite a, a nice talk. Um, so um, uh, Professor Nichols is unable to join us today um, due to a competing commitment, uh, but we have uh, Professors uh, Ako and uh, Tan, um, and I think together we can have a, quite a good discussion. So as I was listening to um, the talks uh, you know, being delivered, I couldn't help but have some questions. And maybe I'll just uh, you know, get the ball uh, rolling. And I should add that uh, please do um, uh, put in your questions in the QAA on the website, um, and uh, you know, uh, we'll try to answer them as best as we can. Um, so perhaps to uh, Professor Ako, um, you know, if, listening to the, the different, uh, you know, American and European guidelines, I, I get a sense that they're sort of similar, but not quite identical. So my first question to you, and, you know, I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Catherine as well, is given the, the nuanced differences between the US and European guidelines, uh, what is a pragmatic approach for us in Asia? That's a, uh, that's a good question. And the first thing, uh, uh, the uh, uh, rate of cardiovascular events uh, are much different 
uh, from Asian population than a Caucasian population. So maybe we need to have some data uh, to justify uh, the guidelines uh, recommendation uh, if you apply those uh, uh, recommendation to uh, Asian population. That's one thing. And the, uh, there are several differences between uh, European guidelines versus American guidelines. But for me, uh, if you talk with uh, your patients, I think European approach, which is a, a guide, a goal-based approach uh, might be uh, better uh, if you are seeing uh, patients in the clinic. That's uh, my impression. Yeah, uh, thanks, Junior. I, I kind of agree. I it seems to work when I tell my my patients in clinic that hey, look, your target is this. You know, go for it. And you know, most good number of our patients are like that. It's easy for them to to work towards the target. Uh, Catherine, what about you? In your practice, um, do you use, do you follow, follow more the US approach or the European approach in, in managing uh, this lipidemia in terms of targets? Uh, we follow the European approach because um, most of my patients have diabetes. So they're very used to sort of the ABC goals. So they're used to having A1C goals and LDL goals. So it's actually easier uh, to motivate them. Uh, when you have a sort of target for them to work towards. So we find that approach easier uh, and also better compliance in our patients. Yeah, I kind of, I, I think that's the main difference. I think from a mental model point of view, having goals uh, help us, you know, um, I guess not just for A1Cs, but also for uh, lipid targets. And, uh, but fundamentally, the, 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 the underlying framework for lipid lowering and for LDL lowering is consistent across both the American and European guidelines. It's just perhaps how, how pragmatic it is in terms of uh, application in practice. Uh, and I have another question also for both of you. you know, um, Increasingly, lipoprotein little a is being identified as, uh, as something we should be mindful of and potentially uh, uh, try to address. Um, but, I, but I also know that there are no real approved uh, therapies available for it. So should I even check the lipoprotein letter A? And if I do have a, a high level of more than 50, what can I do about it? Um, maybe, Junia, over to you first. Uh, yes, that's a difficult, very difficult question. Uh, currently, we have no um, method to uh, specifically address the high uh, LP small A levels. But soon enough, uh, we're going to have uh, some uh, measures uh, to address this question. Uh, this uh, issue. But uh, I think uh, the first thing, again, uh, LP little a level is much different uh, from Caucasian population uh, to uh, Asian population. I, I think uh, in Asian population, we have much lower uh, LP little a level as compared with the uh, uh, Caucasian population. So we have yet to know, know that uh, uh, the impact of this uh, LP little a level in Asian population. So we need definitely need more data to uh, to uh, the age, Asian data. That's one thing. And uh, currently, uh, we are measuring this uh, LP little a level in ASCBD patients. Yes, that's true. But we don't use that as a clinical guidance uh, to uh, change our uh, treatment. Thanks very much, uh, Junior. What about you, Catherine? Uh, is there, you know, how, when you see a very high LP little a, do you, do you change any, in anything you do? I mean, uh, increase the dose of statins or, you know, order a PCSK9 inhibitor. I mean, do those things work? But or niacin? We, don't really have any therapy directly targeting L little a. Okay, PCSK9 inhibitors has some effect. Um, in patients, if they we've we've got referrals for patients just with a high L little a level without any other cardiovascular risk, no prior cardiovascular disease, uh, because it's being checked in the private sector because of the increased awareness. So for these patients, we just try and get them to pay more attention to other risk factors like blood pressure, give up smoking if you're a smoker. So basically we are targeting all the other cardiovascular risk factors because you can't really alter your LP little A level. 
uh, for patients with cardiovascular disease, then we are probably more aggressive in trying to get the LDL to target, and if necessary, use PCSK9 inhibitors on top of the high dose, uh, high intensity statin. Yeah, I think that's that's a bit of a conundrum. I I have begun to check my you know my patients' lipoprotein little A, especially if they have recurrent events despite what appears to be very good LDL control, you know, less than 1.4, less than 1.0. And, and I think, uh, and uh, not surprisingly, some of them do have high lipoprotein little A. I think this, uh, you know, as, as new therapies arrive and if, if, the therapy, uh, if the therapies that are investigated show good clinical outcomes, I think these patients may benefit from such therapy. So we'll, we'll find out. Um, and I, you know, maybe maybe it's good to move on to uh, uh, Catherine's uh, talk in terms of uh, prescribing weight loss. So, I mean, I think some of us um, would have patients who are obese. Can I ask maybe just to start off, um, you know, in terms of the uh, GLP-1 um, agonist, um, do you, do we, do, do both of you routinely order these drugs in your practice? I mean, at what point do you put a trigger? Do you put them through a weight loss program before you prescribe uh, these drugs, which can be expensive? Or do you even offer them the opportunity for bariatric surgery, which has been shown to have good clinical outcomes? So how do you assess them? When do you do it? And do you as a cardiologist junior or an endocrinologist, Catherine, order, them, order these drugs routinely in your practice? So maybe this one, I'll ask Catherine to start first. But for patients who have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, we're now using GLP-1 receptor agonist for the treatment of diabetes anyway. So for our type 2 diabetes patients who are obese, then GLP-1 receptor agonists almost move up, now move up to second line uh, after metformin. Um, for patients without diabetes, we refer purely for obesity. Uh, we always start with lifestyle modification, but most of the time you will need to add uh, pharmacotherapy. Um, in Hong Kong, we have very limited choices. Uh, we only have Olistat and then uh, Liriclotide. So Mectide hasn't been approved for treatment of obesity yet in Hong Kong. Uh, we're using it for treatment of type 2 diabetes. But for Liriclotide, we're now using it in our obese patients even if they are on the waiting list for bariatric surgery. For these very obese patients, uh, even six months of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, get them to lose some weight before surgery, uh, reduce the perioperative risk. Uh, so that's what we're doing at the moment. What about you, Junior? I mean, do you do you order these drugs in your practice? Uh, no, uh, I don't use uh, those drugs. And, and if a patient needs GLP-1, uh, agonists for the treatment of diabetes, we usually refer them, uh, refer the patients to the uh, endocrinologist. And in Japan, uh, GLP-1 receptor ag agonist is not approved for uh, the treatment of obesity yet. So uh, they are not used uh, for the treatment of uh, obesity, but usually uh, I refer those uh, obesity, uh, obese patients to endocrinologists uh, for the treatment. Yeah, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with this because um, if I know a drug can, uh, you know, um, can offer weight loss and, um, and it works through, you know, perhaps uh, as, as uh, Catherine explained with um, helping with uh, feelings of satiety and uh, appetite, then I almost wonder why we should wait um, if, if we can help the patient uh, get to their desired uh, weight goal earlier. But I guess we do need uh, some outcomes data before we, as cardiologists, we are comfortable prescribing it. And of course, uh, it is very um, attractive that we can, you know, uh, obtain up to 20% uh, weight loss. Um, now, having said that, I think, you know, our, our, very, our own, our individual countries will need to uh, approve those drugs. There's going to be a cost consideration and that plus the benefits of lifestyle changes, you know, suggest that, you know, it will be a while before it becomes mainstream use, but I, I think it's exciting. And uh, I think it might help some types of our patients. Um, and to that, I would ask Catherine, you know, um, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitors also have some weight loss effects. Do you use it for weight loss or for, you know, 
for cardiometabolic reasons at all uh, in non-diabetics. But in diabetics, of course, that makes sense. Yeah, in non-diabetics. Uh, in non-diabetics, we are only using it in patients with heart failure or in patients with CKD. But is for weight loss? No, the weight reduction of SGLT2 inhibitors is fairly... Not minimal. enough. Yeah, not really enough. <laughs> you get about two to three kilograms and that's it. So, but with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, we're seeing much more significant weight reduction. What and, about you, uh, Junior? Do you... Yeah, it's, you a, use... it's the same. Uh, we prescribe uh, SGLT2 inhibitors for heart failure patients and CKD patients, but not for the treatment of obesity. But yeah, uh, I mean, uh, yeah talking, talking about GLP-1 again, uh, what's happening in Japan is a lot of private uh, practice patients, they are uh, secretly uh, prescribing GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist uh, to the obese patients, and, the, and patients knew that it works. So uh, that's what's happening. Yeah, I, I think it'll be, it'll be uh, interesting times uh, when we have more data. I, I suspect that, that will be... Uh... Uh, you know, uh, certainly an option for patients, and especially if you can uh, um, affect, uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular outcomes as well. Um, and I guess uh, moving on to the last uh, topic, which is on fish oils, I think Steve gave a very nice overview on um, fish oils, EPA, DHA, the, the, the conundrums, um, or rather the challenges that the reduce it trial, the strength, or MAMI, and and the jealous trials, uh, you know, what, what some of the considerations are. So based on what we have heard, uh, maybe Junior, would you at this point in time order fish oils for your patient? Uh, I mean, yes. As a high dose? Uh, yeah, actually uh, EPA is uh, quite uh, popular uh, in Japanese physicians. And a lot of physicians, so it's approved for the treatment of hypertriglycemia uh, in Japan. So uh, it's, it's often prescribed uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular uh, events uh, after uh, the publication of JELIS, which is uh, 2007, I think. A lot of uh, physicians are quite, you know, uh, feel sa safe in prescribing them. It's very popular. Yeah. What about you, Catherine? I mean, having heard the, the strength study, do you think that would have affected your willingness to prescribe uh, fish oils? We don't have the high dose fish oil in Hong Kong anyway. So what <laughs> our patients are taking is the over the Lots of sushi, yeah. Oh, which is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was, um, I can't help but, uh, and Junior was sorry, I can't help but ask myself, you know, I mean, let's not talk about the, the slight risk of AFib. Maybe we can discuss that later. But in Japan, a country that has, I mean, you know, um, it, you know have a lot of fish, sushi and sashimi and, um, and others, um, do you need that extra fish oil? You know, would it, does it really help that much? Is, yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, chronologic decline in the level of EPA. So that's what we know that uh, uh, compared with the 90s when uh, JELIS was done, uh, now we are seeing less and less EPA levels in Japanese uh, general population. So. That, that's why a lot of uh, uh, Japanese physicians think that EPA works in uh, right population. What, yeah. what about the risk of atrial fibrillation? I mean, should we be worried? I, 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 I don't know. So in JELIS, we didn't see any uh, signal for atrial fibrillation, or maybe they didn't measure uh, that as an endpoint. But uh, it's consistent that we see a more and more atrial fibrillation in the EPA uh, arms. So, but uh, many physicians don't think that that's a real threat. Uh, Catherine, what about you? I mean, the AFib signal, is it a cause of concern? Well, I usually ask our cardiologist colleagues, what's the mechanism anyway? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there are, uh, there was a meta-analysis, I, I can't remember, I think it was uh, one of the ESC meetings or journals that came out uh, that, that suggested that the, you know, with, in a meta-analysis that uh, AFib was associated with uh, these uh, high-dose uh, uh, fish oils. Um, and I guess the combined signal in the strength and reduce it is certainly a concern. I, 
I mean, I would like to see more data come out before I routinely prescribe my patients fish oil. Um, because I, I think um, given the, the issue with the mineral oil and the corn oil, um, as well as the sub studies out of the uh, strength study, I think um, it has put some doubt in my mind as to how, how and when I should order fish oil uh, for my patients and you know, which exact formulation. Um, that additional risk of atrial fibrillation is, is uh, of course further concern. Um, to that, I would say that uh, it's not clear to me whether over-the-counter fish oil you know, that we buy in supermarkets or health food stores, whether those uh, benefits are similar and whether the risk of AFib is the same. So I think that is one area that we, we have to keep an eye for. Um, I wonder whether, um, you know, whether y'all would, uh, how do I put it, uh, recommend uh, over-the-counter fish oil for your patients? So me? Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, over-the-counter uh, over uh, fish oils. And the, um, a lot of Japanese physicians think that high-dose EPA alone can work as a prevention of uh, cardiovascular events. So that's what we are seeing. So that's the conception of Japanese physicians, I think. Right. There is a question in the chat. Uh, maybe I'll just read it out. Um, um, and I think, Catherine, maybe this, you know, you might want to take a step at this. Um, uh, can we use oral GLP-1 um, agonist for weight reduction? Okay, um, the weight loss effects of GLP-1 receptor agonist is dose dependent. So with the oral form of somatotide, um, because of the poor bioavailability, uh, the current approved dose of 14 milligram, one four milligram for the treatment of type two diabetes is equivalent to 0.5 milligram weekly injection. So if you want to use semaglutide to lose weight, we're talking about 2.4 milligram once a week. So if you translate back to oral dose, it will be a very large oral dose. So I don't think that uh, oral, at least currently, oral GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, is not gonna be useful for weight reduction. Right. And, you know, I, I know that the SERPA study, uh, which you, um, or the SERPA 2 uh, study, which you briefly mentioned, um, that the, it appeared that the, the, in the SERPA 2 study that the tazepatite uh, had a greater weight loss reduction um, compared to semaglutide. What are your thoughts on that study? All right, so, um, the dose they compare with uh, is not the 2.4 milligrams magnetite dose for weight loss, because that is mainly for the treatment of diabetes. But looking at the data, uh, to subtype, well, there's no head to head comparison yet for the 2.4 milligram dose of magnetite, but sort of looking at the data, you think to is probably even, is going to be even more potent than some magnetite uh, in weight reduction. So we'll okay. see what, the data when it comes out for when they uh, evaluate subtype in obese individuals. The trials okay. are ongoing. Well, I think these are exciting times in the cardiometabolic arena. And I think this is perhaps a fitting time to close the session. Um, you know, we have heard about um, uh, fish oils. We've heard about uh, guidelines and what lipid guidelines we should adhere to. And we heard about uh, prescribing weight loss with GLP-1 uh, agonists, which hopefully will come to, a, to your country and to your clinic soon. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank um, our speakers, uh, Professors Junior Ako, Professor Catherine Tan, and Professor Steve Nichols for wonderful lectures. And we look forward to seeing you in person and uh, welcome. And hopefully y'all can stay on for the rest of the talks at APSE 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.